Hello and welcome um, to the Institute of Architecture's Sliver Lecture Series, The Selected Friends and Enemies. Tonight, is, it is with great pleasure that I can introduce my, an old classmate, a colleague, and a friend, um, Brennan Buck, with the lecture entitled Eine Heise Viertelstunde. <laughs> Thanks for making me practice my German in public. Um, it is significant that he is here tonight for several reasons. One, because as I look out into the audience, I see a series of students, alumni, colleagues that were fortunate enough to work with Brennan when he taught here from 2004 to 2008 in Greg Lynn's studio. Secondly, he was a huge force and co-creator of the Sliver Lecture Series, which we now all enjoy. And finally, he is um, the, he is representing, probably the most important point, is that he is representing, let's say, the youngest generation of architects that are out there building things, doing things, um, among this, this list of architects that are, um, for the most part, part of the, the established um, field of architects of our time. Since his departure from Vienna in 2008, he has established himself in Brooklyn, New York. He teaches at Yale University and since 2010 has started an architectural practice entitled with the name um, Freeland Buck with um, a colleague and friend David Freeland. They practice between New York and Los Angeles. In this short amount of time, their writing, their work, the writing has been published, the work has been published, and most recently they have been recognized by the Los Angeles AIA as part of their second annual um, ARC IS competition, um, highlighting young, um, young California practices. The office stands out in a field as it balances an experimental approach while having an immediate relevancy. The work itself exploits contemporary digital fabrication, employs special effects strategies, producing a result which is smart, refined, and eloquent. The projects often utilize an oscillation between pattern and color to manipulate depth and produce spatially rich environments and spaces. Brennan, specifically, approaches architecture with a calibrated combination of decisive gestures and subtle sensibilities, which I've always um, sort of admired and watched him resolve in a resolute posture. If you have not heard of him yet, I can assure you, you will. I know I will watch eagerly to see the development with a fair share of admiration and intrigue. Please help me welcome Brandon Buck. Thanks a lot. I want to uh, thank Christy and Wolf for including me in the series. It's great to um, be part of the fourth or fifth year of the lecture series, but particularly this year, um, as I understand, there have been about 20 lectures so far, and I think I'm sandwiched between Greg Lynn and Lynn Moss, so you guys have the heart for, uh, so I appreciate you showing up for this one as well. Um, so, I, uh, as Christy said, I called this talk, I know, I said, Peter Schindler, which, uh, besides showing off my German skills, has a couple of um, specific sort of meanings. Um, one was that it was the name of a theory reader that Christian Muir and I uh, put together for the Lynn class about five years ago uh, about revolutionary moments in, in architecture in, in the 60s. Um, but it's also, for me, a kind of, um, it's suggestive of my time here. I think that it'll be evident that a lot of the work I'll show has a kind of kernel um, that's here. Um, but also, I think it's evocative of, for me anyway, of the Angemata in general. I think there's a value of, evaluation of time over place here. And so there's a sort of absorption in rapidly evolving images and ideas that uh, may be more of the moment than specific to a locale. I think there's a, energy and intensity to um, to that kind of um, 
of contemporary uh, mode of working that you don't find in, in timelessness or in locale. So um, the other thing is I think that there's a idea here that architecture culture is collective. I used to think about the studio as a kind of ecology where you could feed in any set of knowledge or skills and it would kind of grow and proliferate as the students work through it and taught each other and would stay in there for uh, three or four years until um, until there was sort of a turnover of, of students. So um, as Christy said, I was here for four years um, in the Lynn class and I think uh, I want to talk about, I think there's a sort of origin of a lot of the work that's here and I want to talk about it a little bit uh, in relationship to Greg then, and that's convenient because he was here two nights ago and we just sort of laid out this argument about tectonics in the context of um, composite materials, of new forms of materials. And so um, I'm going to not repeat too much of that, but I'm going to agree with maybe 90 or 95 percent of what you said, but come out with the opposite conclusion that there's some territory to be. There's some fertile ground in the expression of many parts as opposed to fewer. Um, so these next two slides you've seen, I'll just talk about them very briefly. Uh, this is the separate sketch which Frampton uses to uh, define tectonics as a set of essential distinctions um, between building and ground, between beam and column. And so the joint is where those distinctions are marked out um, and recognized, where the two types um, that are adjacent are um, symbolized, and, and the joint stands in the entire building. In a topological surface or a composite surface, on the other hand, those kinds of differences are absorbed into the surface, and that's really possible because it's uh, described through calculus, which is a um, the study of differentials, of rates of change. So there are an infinite number of points in any surface, and those points are always described in relationship to their neighbors, not according to any absolute coordinates. Um, and so I think in our work, um, computation works the same way. It's, it's a way of managing a large number of parts as a relational system. Um, but we choose to, rather than expressing it as monolithic continuity. We are interested in the well, multiplicitous continuity of pattern. Um, so uh, just as a really dumb, uh, simple example, on the left is a nerve surface, which is made up of any number of points on the surface, but it's just the whole surface that's expressed. In the middle is a um, polygonal surface. And each of those planar triangular faces are expressed through their edges, and yet they are linked together in the same way. Each face is uh, described in relationship to its neighbors, and any change to any one of them affects the ones around it. Um, in the same way, the, the what I would call um, a patterned assembly on the right is uh, still um, a set of objects which are expressed distinctly as individual objects, but they still maintain that same set of relationships from one to the next. So any change in one um, affects the neighbor. So basically my argument is just that these are all um, cohesive assemblies. It's just that the scale of articulation is different. So a uh, composite surface has these fibers that are woven together and, and glued together through with, with resin, just as the um, pattern assembly has, has these parts. So I think that um, Computation potentially redefines tectonics, tectonic expression, not as a way to distinguish between essential types, but as a way to incorporate complexity and in, in synthesize it. Um, so I'm going to try to, um, well, I guess I should say we're, we're I, I don't want to, I, I guess we're interested in the, the right end of this spectrum. Um, for a couple of reasons. One is that buildings are made up of parts, and um, but I think there's another one in that we think there's a um, potential in using the inherent logic of assembly and construction to produce different kinds of um, expressive 
uh, spatial and atmospheric effects. So um, I'll try to describe what I think are the potentials of this kind of um, synthetic but atomized pattern uh, at three different scales through our work. One is just this scale of fabrication and assembly. So trying to take advantage of the way things come together to produce uh, different kinds of effects. The second scale is at um, a scale of spaces and rooms. So not all buildings are you know, one room open grand halls. Uh, often they need to be uh, broken down into individual rooms, but the pattern allows us to think about those distinct rooms cohesively. Uh, so we can think about uh, the relationship of one room to the next one. And then the last scale is at the scale of city, where urban infrastructure and organizations are generally uh, atomized and segmented or cellular, um, but they can be thought through cohesively. Um, so the um, <coughs> first project was done way over in the big top lines over there. Um, and it's Technicolor Blue, which was an installation project where we were trying to uh, do two things. One was just build a set of doubly curved surfaces with only uh, sheet construction, that the most low tech uh, way that we could possibly uh, think to do it. But then the other idea was to um, try to blur the differences between the facets, between the individual panels, by hyper-articulating them, by subdividing them even further into um, smaller and smaller uh, kind of visual units, which would cross over, so cross over each individual panel. So this is made up of a lot of triangular panels, each of which is further broken down into 12 um, four-sided uh, holes, basically. And so the idea was that that pattern would help uh, blur the distinction between one facet and the next. So it, it started with, uh, initially I was just interested in the way that different types of software describe uh, geometry, describe surfaces. So in the upper left uh, is a um, topographical map of a simple undulating surface. Okay. And, um, five different ways that it's described in, through different types of geometry. And part of the idea was that you could flatten, you could get that subdivision or tessellation pattern and flatten it and still evoke some of the undulation and relief or depth in those patterns. So, I mean, these are all inherently two-dimensional, but um, we ended up cutting some of these out of just flat sheets of, of acrylic. And the idea was that you could read some of the original uh, undulation screen. So when it came to the installation project in the Silver Gallery, um, formally it was just a set of surfaces which would produce a kind of tunnel through the middle of the space and, and divide it in half and sort of interrupt and, and re-channel the flow of people through the space. Um, but we were, as I said, interested in how we, we basically modeled this form, these three different surfaces, and then looked at different ways that uh, we could uh, describe it through, describe that geometry through pattern. So, um, so these, we, we just went through a lot of uh, different types. This one on the left here was the final uh, version that we <coughs> went with. But we just experimented with a lot of different ways of describing these surfaces and, and breaking them down. Um, but I think that we thought about these not, we thought about these as generic, um, uh, as basically the most sort of uniform and uh, even way to break down those surfaces. And so we designed the form and then we redesigned the pattern that produced the form. So we introduced a whole series of uh, creases and concentric points of convergence um, as a way to produce different types of illusion in the surface. So the creases uh, were intended to uh, produce the effect of folds, even sometimes there are actual folds in the surface, sometimes there aren't. 
the points of convergence are, are uh, supposed to um, suggest uh, forms that may or may not be there. So there's kind of a, at times the pattern reinforces the actual form that's there, and at times it undermines it. Um, so we were kind of interested in the, the um, just the experimentation and the relationship between the form and the pattern that produced it. So this is the, the bottom view, um, that kind of interior space, which moves through the center of it. Um, and then this is all three of those surfaces unfolded. Uh, and you can see the degree to which we were manipulating the, the pattern to produce all kinds of small micro symmetries and, and objects in the, in the field. Um, we also say we, there were two other things that we were sort of techniques that we were designing with. One was color, obviously, um, and then the other one was the porosity. Uh, relative porosity or opacity of the uh, surface, the size of the holes that we were cutting. So you can see at the bottom, um, it's much more opaque, and the holes are smaller, and then it's much more lattice-like and, and light at the top. Um, so all these were just triangular, uh, very thin triangular um, panels cut out of um, plywood uh, and painted on one side. And then there were, there were a lot of them. And then um, basically uh, connected together as sandwich panels. So there were always two of these together, or almost always. And we painted the inside surface of <coughs> one of the sandwich sides. So in other words, there, there are two outside surfaces and two inside surfaces in the sandwich panel. And the idea was that you would always, by painting one of the interior surfaces, you would always <coughs> see that color through the screen of the white lattice sort of in front of it, or else looking in the other direction, you would just see the color on the edge of the holes as it was cut. So, um, and then we had many, many panels, um, uh, which we had to organize in this uh, very complicated hierarchical uh, way in order to um, put them together. Uh, and so each of those triangular panels gets uh, cable bound together to produce these larger blocks. Um, and once we had those, uh, it went very quickly. There was about um, maybe nine or ten hours of uh, set of time in the gallery, of which a couple of those was um, waiting for an art student who had made this giant orange sculpture of a horse to take photos of himself uh, covered in grease and naked sitting on a horse. So we needed to do this in that space. And so we uh, delayed our beginning of assembly until he was uh, in those photos. Um, and then we uh, added the installation. So there were at times more cable binders than I had hoped, but, um, but this is that uh, <coughs> interior space in the end. So you can see this is the side through which you only read color at the edges of the holes. Um, but you can see some of the other surfaces sort of, uh, peeking through at the top, some of the other colors. So this is sort of what, what I um, go back on. I, I think the types of um, points of convergence and the creases that we were um, trying to introduce or experiment with are, are, are visible here and, and also <coughs> here, where at times uh, they accentuate a corner, or at times they blur the kind of filleted continuity. Surfaces. And here, I think the, the degree to which we redesign the surface to produce these small figures and, and symmetries um, is pretty evident. So, one other thing that we were interested in with the, the exhibition there was trying to use the intricate um, fineness of the actual structure to 
produce these really large drawings. So they're um, they're two and a half meter drawings where they have very different effects from far away and uh, from close up. They have a lot of really fine grained uh, detail, and so trying to think graphically about some of the effects that we were uh, producing through the, the installation. So this project. Um, the rest of these projects were collaborations um, with David Freeland, my business partner. <coughs> and this project, um, in, in, a, in a way that this project also owes a lot to my time in the Lynn Studio, there were a series of projects um, which we were calling surface crochet projects, which uh, produced a kind of porous <laughs> mass from the laying up of many, many surfaces. Uh, one of those was Peter Richter's um, company made entirely out of um, Tyvek uh, paper. Um, but so, rather than, so, so that started me doing a series of studies that I was calling the surface crochet studies, which rather than trying to produce continuity along a surface, would produce continu continuity through the depth, through extrusion. Um, and so, I, I was interested in that and also how, um, Patterns may be broadly evocative of uh, very sort of generic, general um, categories. So I think in a couple of the other projects I'll show, there's an interest in the boundary between representation and abstraction. And I think we never want to produce images that have a direct, obvious, one-to-one -one meaning. But I think we are interested in trying to be evocative and, and evoke, evoke as broad, uh, categories of possible, or as, as um, a broad set of associations as possible. And so this was just an experiment um, with that to try to think about really general categories, including uh, structure, uh, natural or, or organic growth, and then this category, which I called bank, which um, was inspired by Louis Sullivan's bank buildings in the Midwest, but is a kind of hierarchical <laughs> center of uh, organization. But each of those three were extruded through a simple cube um, to produce a, a space, um, a very generic uh, orthogonal space, but one with a really pretty dynamic orientation and set of, of views. So that structural mesh is extruded through the cube at like an oblique angle. Um, and so what you get is a clear view um, from some angles and a totally opaque surface from, from others. So the four elevations of the cube are um, at the bottom of the page, and some of which are very porous and some of which are not. Um, and then we're just extruding um, these in different ways. So this one is uh, distorted in one dimension, this one in two. So you get a change in scale from one side to the other um, in the elevations. And then this one uh, basically takes that mesh and extruded, extruded mesh and, and twists it so that you get a variation within a single elevation of porosity um, and scale. So these were very, these are all the elevations um, combined. These were very abstract and, and we were interested in how to materialize them a bit. So um, we did this competition entry um, for uh, competition in the UK um, for a pavilion with uh, an art gallery called the Lightbox Gallery. And essentially, they wanted a, a pavilion to have small parties, lectures, and exhibitions. Um, and they wanted to put it in their um, kind of forecourt to the building. So it had to both have this one small room, but also allow people to move around it, or an artist through it, to get to the front door of the building. So they're essentially in terms of massing, it was a very simple exercise of conforming to the site and then making the room, but also making a, a passageway through the pavilion um, in addition to that room, we were calling it the canyon. Um, and then trying to subdivide that um, uh, with this kind of extruded mesh. So the other thing that about, about this competition was that it was sponsored by this company called Facet which uh, uses a CNC mill to produce these modular plywood 
structural cassettes, which are then just brought to the site um, by hand, uh, put together as walls and floors. And so um, it seemed pretty obvious to, to us that since you had the CNC mill, part of the brief was to uh, take a non-modular approach to this same idea. Um, not all of these uh, cassettes have to be the same. Um, and so we basically just came up with a triangular version of this, which could vary uh, in scale and, and shape. So each cassette is made up of five, three surfaces uh, along the edge, and, and two, um, two kind of uh, panels which knitted together, and, and those, they're just notched together, dry, dry stacked, and then um, you know, extruded very, extruded maybe um, a foot uh, for the walls and extruded much deeper to produce the floors and the ceilings. And so the, this is our very composite um, axon of that system. What we were really most interested in though was the kind of this kind of continuity that I'm alluding to, which is through extrusion rather than um, along a surface. And so we started with this in the lower left, this really kind of generic triangulated set of gradients from small and dense to sparse um, and larger in the middle. But as that pattern was extruded through, we had to deal with different things, um, sort of snapped to different geometries at each of the three, at the north wall, the south wall, and the there. So at the north wall, uh, the massing uh, folded and bent, and it had to, to kind of align to that. It had to align to the roof. In the south wall, there was this door to and then the stair as well. So what we got, um, this adapted tessellation, uh, was something that was much more complex and interesting, we thought, um, as a result of having to kind of connect these different um, surfaces together. And the idea was that through this continuity of extrusion, you would feel a bit like you were in um, sort of continuous semi-solid zone between between these walls, but in a, in a continuous kind of matrix. Um, and so you get, this is the, the canyon, the passageway through. Um, and it opened up a different way of producing these W curve surfaces for us, which was to produce them through the, the edge by trimming the edge. Um, so the implied surface of all of these cut cassettes could be whatever we uh, wanted it to. Uh, and then on the uh, other side of that wall in the lecture and um, gallery space, those are expressed differently, not as a continuous surface, but as each one is cut vertically, so it's a, it's a stack, each one is uh, individually um, sort of uh, stepped out. With, with the gallery, um, the canyon, and then the stair to the roof. So we were, uh, we thought that this sort of CNC non-modularity was an obvious way to go, but the, the jury uh, didn't, didn't think so, but we uh, had an opportunity to realize a small chunk of it um, at an exhibition that David Freeland curated in LA uh, this spring. Um, and so we basically took a uh, small modified um, piece of it and uh, fabricated it. So it's a dry stack of these triangular um, units, which are expressed uh, as a continuous surface on the inside and as this <laughs> more masonry stack um, on the outside. Uh, and each of the each of them is assembled. <laughs> Individually, and then they notch. They notch together, but they also notch through from one to the next. So there's no adhesive, and then in general they're uh, extruded about a foot. But then at the ceiling, they're extruded much deeper to enclose the space against the wall. And we also um, we stained. We we used five different colors of, of white or different tones of white stain in order to exaggerate or reinforce this uh, shift from the small panel, panels to the larger ones. And then 
like with Technicolor Bloom, you were interested in how the buildup of all of these connections and notches and um, could work graphically and work as a from a distance, almost as a set of tones, as a field, um, and then up up closer as an actual set of details. <coughs> so um, these drawings are also pretty large, um, maybe two meters by one and a half or something. So that was the small scale, the fabrication and construction scale. Um, this is the, the rooms and spaces scale. So this project is a house um, in Maine, which is the, uh, for you, the, the northeastmost um, state in, in the U.S. And it's a very rural area. Um, the site was forested. And we were really interested in the kind of space that the forest produces, which is a fairly dense um, you know, alternation of solid and void. Um, and so in Maine, there are, uh, hunting is, is a really common uh, hobby and, or, or the sport. And uh, what often, um, how it's often done is, is through these tree stands, which is just a platform uh, in the tree, which you sit up there, you've got a, a longer view over across the forest and you can see if any deer come by. But we were um, interested in the way that the deer stand um, could produce a, a similar kind of density or rhythm of solid and void that the forest does. So we, in the upper left, just mapped the forest itself and, and then imagined a kind of bizarre uh, repetition of these deer stand platforms between every four trees. And so what you get is a very even alternation of platform and void, platform and void, um, up in the upper right-hand corner. And then given our massing, uh, we tried to incorporate uh, a series of solids and voids into that kind of continuous imagined matrix. So the other idea was that we didn't want to interrupt that um, uh, continuous kind of alternation of the forest with the house, but the house is about a mile from the ocean on a hillside. Um, and so we wanted to try to use the house itself, the footprint itself, as our tree clearing strategy. So we wouldn't remove any trees outside of that footprint, but as you would, the wedge of the house would be embedded in the hillside. You would approach it from above um, so that the house itself would be a kind of foreground for your view out over the trees to the ocean um, beyond. So that gave us really the, the wedge uh, massing that we ended up using. And we, when we were studying that massing as a set of rooms and courtyards, um, which uh, sort of twist in, in three dimensions, we were, our ambition was to make that completely free of hierarchy, that the figure of the courtyards and the figure of the rooms would alternate. Um, and there was never any um, privileging of one or the other. So both the rooms and the courtyards just meet at a corner at a point, both at the roof, the roof plan on the left, and the floor plan on the right. Um, but in, in between, they uh, each unit twists to produce um, surfaces which are adjacent to each other. So you can move through these uh, diamond-shaped openings from one room to the next. And so these are the, those six units, two of which, sorry, four of which are double height, the two floors, and then two, two of which are just one. And these are the kind of <coughs> interior spaces you get. So there's a lot of um, looking through an outdoor space into another interior space. And the idea was that by weaving <coughs> the exterior through the interior of the house, um, you could, this is really a, a sort of vacation house which would be occupied intermittently. So you could um, get the different colors of, of light and, and um, the kind of exterior changing um, 
qualities of the seasons to invade the house as much as possible. And so this is the, these are the two floors. The top floor is where you, you come from above, from the left. Um, the top floor is where uh, all of the public spaces are. The, um, and then the lower level are where the bedrooms are kind of um, embedded in the hillside. And those are those two different levels, the upper level and one of the bedrooms in the lower level. And then this is the approach to the house, um, where as I said, the, the roof top of the house, which we were imagining as a kind of green roof, which would be whatever the forest floor was, um, depending on the season, would be growing on, on that roof. Uh, the roof is the foreground for the view out past the house to the, to the ocean. And then you move down the steps and into the, into the top floor of the house. So we were also, because the vegetation on that roof would change, um, along with everything else. We were interested in how the figure of, this, of the courtyards and the rooms would shift as the tree canopy um, changed. Uh, our commission work, um, there's, there's some residential and then there's some um, commercial interiors, so uh, generally restaurants um, and bars all of which are in LA. Um, and so this is a um, project, which is a deli and, and restaurant, which we were interested in some of the same ideas of uh, rhythm and, and spatial subdivision. But it's really just a single room, a uh, single storefront, which was uh, very long and narrow and tall with this single skylight um, above. And so, the client was interested in um, having an open kitchen where the um, the guests, the lunchers, would uh, enter from the top uh, in the front door, move past the kitchen as they ordered, um, paid for the food, and then receive the food, and then move out through the back door at the bottom of the drawing um, to this patio where most of the seating was. For various reasons, the health department in LA um, any uh, table and chairs from the space. So uh, we had a, a, a bench that's kind of a bar situation in the front and this informal furniture running down the side. But we were interested in how we could produce some, some sort of rhythm and uh, alternation in the space as you move through it from front to back. And that was mainly through this um, ceiling landscape. So we took the existing natural skylight and produced two artificial copies. Um, the, uh, <coughs> the original skylight is there, um, and then we repeated it twice right in front of the store to um, produce this, these three pretty dramatic um, light scoops. The ceiling was high enough that we could bring them down uh, pretty low and have a lot of relief in the ceiling. Um, and then together, they sort of produce this undulating, um, twisting uh, landscape. So we looked at a lot of different ways of expressing that um, as completely uh, monolithic um, drywall, as egg crate, um, and what we ended up with was the lower right version, which was a combination of drywall and, and vertical uh, baffles, which allowed us to put the lighting um, behind them. So this is the uh, the amount of height that we had and, and the degree to which we could come down um, from it. And then the drywall, which all these surfaces are, surfaces are twisted just enough that we could use um, drywall. And then this is when it's um, back and painted. And then this is the finished version of the space. So um, this is that procession back through the store out to the, to the patio with the open kitchen on the left. And then in the front of the store, the restaurant, the, there's a, these, the, this front uh, light scoop has a pretty imposing um, presence both from one side and the other. And then the, the kind of landscape uh, would be. <coughs> so one other thing 
about this long linear space was that we had this west wall, which um, was also um, continuous from front to back and very present in the space. And so the, the client was really interested in having this be a, a kind of uh, slow food institution where everything was sourced locally and, and organically. And so they had this image in their head of, of the Alps and that that was sort of the image that they wanted to create and they had a specific photograph. Um, so at the top is this west wall, the section shows the kind of ventilation and ceiling. And then what we ended up doing was taking that image of the Alps and trying to look at ways to bring it from totally representational toward uh, abstraction and try to feed in different kinds of associations and readings um, that weren't, that, that preserved a kind of ounce of Alps, but also added in a whole other set of uh, digital um, associations. So essentially it's abstracted um, as a series of bits of different scales, of, of squares, and those are inscribed into the um, set of plywood uh, panels, which were painted white, and so when it's milled away, you get the, the brown core of the, the depth of the MDF panel. Um, so the idea was that you would have the kind of um, undulation and rhythm of, of the landscape, but it would be read through this really intense filter of kind of um, digital uh, embossing. Okay, so this is the last um, project I'll show, and it's at the scale of the city. Um, so here we were interested in how pattern could not just be geometric um, and organizational, but responsive over time. So this project is in Detroit, which is really famous for being probably the um, most dramatically shrinking city in the world. And so this chart at the top um, records the number of occupied houses, the number of abandoned houses, and then the number of vacant lots. So as uh, jobs disappeared, um, people were moving out of the city over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, and there was no one moving back in to buy their houses, so they just left them and abandoned them. Uh, and so they became um, sources of, of crime. And so the city started to demolish them, but they, as you can see from the kind of light gray uh, bar, they had a difficult time keeping up, but there's this kind of slow and steady uh, abandoning and demolition of houses in the city. And so we were looking at that pattern um, of vacancy, but also in the lower middle, um, the pattern of foreclosure, particularly after 2008, where if what if the majority of the vacant lots are in a kind of ring around the core of the city right now, the ring of foreclosed houses, which presumably will be um, abandoned and demolished uh, fairly soon, sort of balloons out from there. And so what we anticipated, both in terms of numbers and geography on the right, um, is that this would be a kind of inexorable um, decrease in, in population. And so what you have is a situation where the remaining houses are surrounded by these vacant lots, just unoccupied land. And so in this aerial photo of one part of Detroit there, that in circles, the gray circles are, are remaining houses. So you can see that many blocks where there were 20, 30, 40 houses, there are now two or three and are um, sort of findings about the trends of foreclosure and, and suggest that, that that'll spread um, through this neighborhood and, and through the city. So we were interested in a, trying to do a, have a strategy which um, would let, let me say that the, while there's now kind of too much infrastructure, there's a density of street grid, which is not really necessary given the number of houses that remain. There's also this additional layer that's sprung up of um, <coughs> circulation routes which don't conform to the orthogonal 
grid of the streets. Um, so we were interested in that. But um, we were also, uh, I mean, to come up with a solution, some of the most obvious solutions were totally uh, impracticable here. One is that you can't add infill because no one is interested in buying. You also can't, there's no reason to add infrastructure because there's already too much. There are too, too many streets, too much water and sewer, too much electrical infrastructure for the population density. So we were interested in a, um, trying to ease the transition from urban to rural in a way that didn't require any of those strategies. And so we started thinking about the Jeffersonian grid, which was the way the US government divided up the American West in order to make it um, ownable and settled. So it was divided up into, into an orthogonal grid of townships and then properties, each of which then, once they were subdivided, could um, be bought and sold and, and built on. And so what we, uh, our ambition was to do sort of an inverse strategy, where rather than subdividing this vacant, empty uh, land in the West, we were going to try to super divide uh, the vacant land in Detroit. So add new boundaries that would help scale up the perceived size of individual lots and properties. Um, and we wanted to do that through a technique of rural land um, division, which is the hedgerow lines of, of trees. Um, and so the idea was that um, that when a given house was demolished, um, a series of hedgerows could be planted between it and its neighboring houses on that vacant public land, and they would continue um, until they reached some kind of private property. And what they would do was redivide um, that vacant territory so that rather than on the left, what you have now is tiny lots that are occupied, surrounded by vacant territory of what was once demolished, what, what is, what was once houses but are now demolished. Um, and what you would get in return is, is a larger scale set of precincts, which are newly defined by these hedgerows, in which in the middle drawing the two houses in, that, in the center now occupy this larger expanse of, of ground. And, and that is uh, sort of woven together by this network of forest and agricultural land and community gardens, which is um, the result of the, of the hedgerows. And so we wanted this, this was a sort of algorithm, which wasn't just geometric. It was geometric, but it was also um, responsive. And so the idea was that the city every year could map out the um, houses that had been demolished that year, and also map out the interest of different communities in this program. So uh, the owners of nearby houses would be surveyed and asked, do you want to be included in this um, hedgerow program? And, and so based on those two maps, a series of hedgerows would be charted and then planted. And then the following year, those maps would be reproduced. And so as changes of um, demographic changes, changes of um, interest in the program, um, each year would be uh, incorporated into the algorithm and, and, and it would adapt year by year by year. Um, so it's also geometric in the sense that it's a very simple um, way of splitting the different, the distance between an event, uh, demolished house and its closest neighbors with these hedgerows, and the, those hedgerows were just extended as far as they could be through this vacant territory um, that remained. And so the initial um, kind of cluster of hedgerows would be, would define a single vacant lot, which would be excavated uh, and allowed to fill up as the um, star drains emptied into it as a kind of reservoir to um, help maintain the agricultural fields which grew up around it and the hedgerows themselves. So over time, um, these clusters of hedgerows 
grow together to produce a kind of network um, of uh, forest, forested land, agricultural fields, and gardens. And this is the spatial idea. So if right now you have um, a series of houses in an undifferentiated, abandoned uh, area, through the redivision um, of that land, you start to get uh, more clearly defined precincts, where at the bottom you get uh, a forested zone, a zone for those two houses, which is sort of uh, directly associated with them, this reservoir, the um, fields, etc. So e I think even um, we were worried about even involving, getting involved in sort of legal um, redefinitions of these, of ownership of the, of the property. So basically there would be no legal um, kind of wrangling necessary because just through the planting of these trees, we think that the perceived boundaries of the city would, would change and would scale up to a rural scale as opposed to um, an urban scale. And so this longer term, the strategy would be aimed not just at transitioning to that rural scale, but also starting to stabilize the houses that remain and, and the communities that remain as a archipelago of smaller uh, villages uh, surrounded by and woven together by this network of hedgerows um, and agricultural fields. That's why you stabilize them. But uh, of course, uh, we know that we need a lot of infrastructure to, uh, to maintain them. Did you give this a thought? I mean, we, I think one of our initial assumptions was that there was already a tremendous amount of infrastructure there. Um, and that, in fact, we wanted to think about ways of reusing or, or um, changing the use of, of some of that. So in a lot of situations, these hydros actually uh, run through the streets and, and cut them off, and there then potentially um, sports, sports, and, and that sort of thing. I think that the I, the observation that there's still a kind of sprawl to the proposal um, is is definitely valid. I think. I mean, I guess there's there's a lot of pride in any any city and a lot of history, and, and that's certainly true in Detroit, and so. We feel like there's a sort of radical change inherent to this. I mean, accepting that the population is going to continue to decline may or may not be very um, popular there. And so I guess to, we sort of saw this as a kind of middle ground between accepting that the city was you know, going to be gone and dead um, and some sort of transition which might actually be um, possible. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>